sitting here, meal here, meal yep. here, meal with meal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll already call it. Oh, you've got a survivability stands, it's considered hardened. This facility has four blast doors made of steel I-beams welded together. There's one pair here that would have protected the crew from an external blast, another pair behind us between the launch control center and the cableway going to the silo. That would have protected the crew from an internal missile mishap. <laughs> Okay, overhead lights, the emergency lights are spin on, springs for shock isolation. Um, you can see springs inside those green canisters to your left. Um, motor can, the loopy cables, it's not that the electrician was drunk, that's deliberate for strain relief to allow that motor control panel to bounce up and down. Okay, real quick here, put both hands on this uh, door handle and lean back. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, good job. You know how much you just pulled? A lot, right? Yeah, three tons, six thousand pounds. What's your name? Cheryl. Cheryl. down just don't lean against the back too much uh, yeah. little cases could fall over but they're pretty stable all right we got room for one more um i need somebody to be my commander turn the key answer a few questions participate have a little bit of fun mm -hmm. yeah you want to do it yeah yeah good you you can take off your hard hats in here it's the only place you can do that so it's a good opportunity to take advantage of um okay what's your name 
structure that is constructed like a bird cage. The floor of the bird cage level three below us, that's where the equipment room is. The dome of the bird cage level one above us, that's where the Spartan crew quarters are, which you saw in the video. Kind of like Motel 2, you're not missing anything by not seeing the crew quarters. They look a lot better in the video than they are in real life. <laughs> Around this room are eight gigantic green springs. Those giant springs allow this entire three-story structure to bounce up and down 18 inches. With the rattle space that you walked over when you walked into this room, uh, the missile can go side to side foot. So if the missile 255 feet away had ever been launched, the crew would have hardly heard or felt it when the room spilled your coffee cup. Uh, we're going to go around the room, talk about the objects and panels in the room, starting in the far back corner, that big silver barrel is blast valve 5. That's what draws fresh air in from the outside where you saw that air conditioning unit. There's also a trigger inside that barrel that snaps shut with just a tiny amount of over pressure. That would have occurred when the missile would have launched. And when that uh, occurs, this entire facility is operating on recirculated air. Next to that silver barrel is the Red Emergency War Safe. That had all the items necessary to affect the front of the launch. The crew that was already on duty would spread the contents of the safe across the desk, and Major Bill and I will be your deputy if that's okay. We would inventory the contents. Once we got them inventory, Major Bill would set the combination to his lock, put it on the left. I'd set the combination to mine, put it on the right. Neither of us knew the combo of each other's locks, therefore it always took two people to open that safe. Next to the safe were three racks of radio panels. Those provide redundancy for receiving the launch order. They also connect to the hard antennas up above on the surface. The deputy could have used this antenna control panel to raise those antennas up above the surface if need be. The deputy who sat in this chair was typically a first or second lieutenant studying to be a commander. The commander was generally an O3 captain, sometimes an O4 major. The deputy was responsible for safety, security, and communications. This is our launch clock. This clock was spring run once a week on Sunday morning, half twice a day by phone or shortwave radio antenna that by the antenna you saw when you drove in the parking lot, hacked to the atomic clock in Boulder, Colorado. It was accurate to the second. Time on this clock is right about 21.30. Time on the local or lunch clock, don't confuse them, is a little past 14.30. That's a seven hour time difference, Commander. Uh, why are these clocks on the same time? What time is that one on? That's on 21.30. Soviet, Russia. Well, you're a little farther west. Don't you use those? Oh, oh that's right. Not Russian Zulu. time. Zulu. Zulu, very good. Zulu. Yeah. Um, military, it's based on GMT time. GMT. Military calls it Zulu or Z time uh, based on zero meridian in Grand <coughs> England. That way, all troops around the world are operating on exactly the same time zone. There's no confusion. The deputy was also responsible for tracking the location of all personnel on site. Anytime someone changed levels, he or she could use this high tech grease pencil annotated on the locator board. Had a couple of tools to help him do that. Up here, there's an annunciator panel. If someone or something that weighed at least 50 pounds crossed the radar beams in the tipsies, they would turn an alarm and a red light. You'll see and hear that during the simulated launch. Uh, this is our TV monitor that gave the crew a view of what that closed circuit TV in the trap Mary might have seen. Now, we can't get parts to fix our broken 1963 monitor, but back in the day it did work. The crew would have known if somebody was in that area. The video talked about the two person policy. In this room, one of those two people always had to be a commissioned officer. We've got a young gentleman occupying the commander's seat right now. Could one of you ladies have sat in that chair? What do you think? Oh, yes. Not in 1963, absolutely not. But by 1978, Titan II became the first combat assignment open to women, not only in the Air Force, but also in DOD. So towards the end of the program, they did allow women in four crew positions. In fact, our museum director, Devon Morris, one of the last Titan II crew commanders. In terms of the enlisted personnel, one of those individuals was known as the BMAC, or Ballistic Missile Analyst Technician. That person was like the computer geek of the day. They could use the missile fault locator panel to run non-destructive testing on the weapon system, check out all the circuits and relays in the missile, make sure it was good to launch. The second individual was like a building superintendent. He or she was known as the MFT or missile <coughs> facilities technician. That person was responsible for monitoring dozens of systems on site, everything from water to hydraulics to elevator operation to electrical power using this power control board. 
Site purchase of electrical power from a local commercial source, Trico Electric. You lose power in your house out here during the monsoon season. It's inconvenient, but it's not really a big deal. For the missile, it is a big deal. The gyroscopes in the missiles I and you are inertial measurement unit, have to be kept constantly spinning at all times. They can't afford to lose power for even half a second. So there's a couple of backup systems on site. On level three of the silo, there's a 350 kilowatt generator driven by a 510 horsepower diesel. Even with a heater blanket against that diesel, it tilts up that generator at least a minute to come online. Way too long for the missile. So below us in the equipment room on level three are two 28 volt batteries, each about the size of this console. Those batteries are kept trickle charged at all times. There's also a rectifier down there that converted AC to DC. There was enough power in those batteries to power everything you see in light green around this room. Open that 760 ton silo door and launch the missile. So the missile could have been launched on battery power alone. We need quite an engineering feat when you stop to think about it. This is the commander's council. It's like the dashboard on your car. It gives me the bill a snapshot or summary of the status of all systems on site. Tells him what's failing, doesn't tell him why it's failing. That's what he's got his crew to investigate for. Bottom row, things related to facilities. Things like the presence of fires, vapors, open gates and doors. That's the MFT's responsibility. Middle row status of the missile itself is the inertial guidance system operational. That's the DMAT's concern. Top row, left-hand side, targeting status, targets one, two, and three. Right-hand side, 58-second launch sequence. What target is the site sitting on, Commander? Which one is lit up? Target two. Excellent. Target two is a ground burst target. That means it's directed against another underground target, like an underground command and control. Relate the exact launch time, writing grease pencil Z time across the face of the clock. That way, everybody in this room knew exactly what time the missile was supposed to lift off. Might have been in minutes, hours, day or days, depending on where Target 2 fit into the overall single integrated operations plan or PSYOP, SAC support plan. You did not want to launch a Titan 2 missile against a target if there's going to be friendly like B-52s flying overhead. The pilots and navigators, like my uh, partner Luke, would probably not appreciate that a whole lot, so the launch time was pretty important. The last part of the message dealt with the code to unlock the butterfly valve block. That was a fail-safe mechanism added later on in the program to one of the oxidizer lines going into the stage two engine. There are two fuel lines and two oxidizer lines that go into that engine. On each of those lines is the butterfly valve. All four butterfly valves have to be in the open down position for the propellant flow to enable the missile to lift off. The only way that all four butterfly valves come open is if you have the code to unlock the butterfly valve block. The only time that that code was on site here was when a valid launch order was received. Wings and Mampos never even had that code. Major Joe will then typically delegate his BMAT and put that code into this panel right there. Behind that panel are six thumb wheels. On each of those thumb wheels are 16 characters. So in terms of possible combinations for that code, 16 to the sixth power. Is that a little bit or a lot? It's a lot. You're exactly right. Kind of hard to guess that exactly. Uh, there was a gentleman that came here several years ago for a private tour with his son. He thought for about 15 seconds and he said, oh, about 16 and a half million. He was pretty close. His name, Bill Gates. The actual number, 16,777,216 possible combinations for that code. Can you guess that? No. Pretty good. Um, you I think that'd be enough? A little. Yeah, a little, just a little, yeah. yeah. Uh, you'd think there'd be enough security, but not for SAC. There was also a trice counter on that lock. Over the life of the weapon system, one had six attempts to input the correct code. If even on the seventh attempt you're inputting the correct code, the lock were rejected from the electronic suicide. Maintenance team would have to be called to come out from Davis Mouth and reset the lock, get the missile back online. We've gone from green to red. Everybody in the world knows about it. Uh, you and I are in a whole bunch of trouble. Yeah, but with your left hand up here, you will have to turn it in just a little bit. And then when you do, it'll be about to three or four o'clock to the right. Um, okay, you're looking for a green launch enable light. I'm looking for lights up here. You're going to say three, two, one, launch. When you say launch, we're both going to turn our keys to the right. Three, two, <laughs> one, launch. Okay, hold the key. You should have a green launch enable light here. Excellent. Good job. All right. Uh, Green launch enable light, welcome to World War III. Uh, batteries <laughs> activated, light is on, indicating electrolyte is formed to the two dry storage batteries on board that power the missile in flight. Takes about 30 seconds for those batteries to charge. Once they're charged, the APS 
You forgot to unlatch it. You're right, and I don't know what would happen uh, if I did it was, that. You just okay. blew us all up. We, I just blew it all up? Okay. There, I'll I don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully nothing, okay? You're right. For the simulation, we typically don't lift this up. Okay? All right. So uh, what happened was we had guidance go. The missile knew where it was going, and then the fuel and oxidizer are, like, are coming together in the base of the side of the hyperbolic when they do. We should get the Claxton fairly shortly here, unless the latch screwed everything up. I hope we do. Please don't. They're sitting in here for Yeah. And it's not uh, it's not going to work. We'll be sitting there again. And obviously the the silos are not yeah. So even we are all here. here when the site was operational. This is N10 off the assembly line at Martin Mariana near Denver, Colorado. It was used to train maintenance and operations crews at Shepard Air Force Base, Texas. It never had any of that nasty propellant in it, so it's safe for use for the museum. We're fortunate to have it. Uh, the maintenance stage you see are in the down position for demonstration purposes only. When the missile launched, they would have been up and retracted. And when the missile did launch and the engines fired, there was a tremendous amount of noise created. Noise is energy. If that energy had not been dissipated, the missile would be different. This is only about that of a dime or a quarter would have shaken apart before it ever left the hole. And that process of converting water into steam is what absorbs most of the sound. I know I have a boat, but the sound is better than the picture to your right, uh, that is the view you'll see of the missile when you go to view now. From the top down, you can see about three-fourths of the thrust mount inside pool. That was a nine megaton, nine million ton warhead, large warhead that was put on the U.S. weapon. 600 times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped in World War II. In the air burst mode, that warhead could destroy an area about 40 by 30 miles, 900 square miles, area about the size of metropolitan Tucson. Yeah, but yeah. 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 Yeah.